Hi, uh, my name's Benno Rice and I'm an election addict. Um, <laughs> it's been 155 days since my last election. Um, um, sorry? Do you have medication for that? I don't know. Um, I've voted in seven federal elections, five state elections, uh, recently a Linux Council election. Um, I'm not choosy. Um, uh, I also, and I know this is a rare thing for a, a geek at a conference like this, I have opinions. Um, one of them is that uh, something's kind of broken in the way we elect our Senate here in Australia. Um, so I just want to start out with a small experiment. Uh, hands up who here voted in the most recent federal election in Australia. Good, good. Uh, well, well, no, if you're, if you're not Australian, you didn't vote, and if you did, then what? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, okay. Anyone here who is Australian who voted in the most recent federal election, uh, leave your hand up if you voted above the line in the Senate, and leave your hand up if you know for the party you voted for who was their second preference. What about their third? <laughs> There are two hands up. That's two more than I expected. Um, another quick experiment. This is to illustrate another problem with the system. Uh, who voted in the Australian federal election in Western Australia? Above the line for the Australian Christians. If there were 14 hands up, Scott Ludlam of the Greens would have been elected in the first, brown, in the first count. The Australian Christians, mind you. Um, so, just to explain to the non-Australians and or, and or everyone else who doesn't understand how this all works, uh, when we vote for the Senate, we get handed something that looks a bit like this. This is part of one. Um, um, when, 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 we, when we vote, we, are, we are, can either put a box above the line in one of these boxes up here, or we can vote below the line. The, di the problem is that you can either put one number, a single one, in any box above the line, but only one, or you can fill out every box below the line. And it's a, it's a preferential order, um, so it, it indicates the preference that you want, uh, that you are trying to elect six candidates with. There's a quota form. If anyone wants further details on anything about this, talk to me afterwards. I'm going to have to skip over bits of this. I'm going to get it anywhere through this. Um, the problem with this is that you can end up with interesting things like this. Um, this is the West Australian count, the 141st count in the Senate count, the first version. This is the key count here. You can see here, these are the 14 votes I was talking about. In this, in this scenario, the Australian Christians get excluded. Their preferences go to the Shooters and Fishers, who then have more votes than Wayne Dropulich of the Sports Party. He then goes... Um, they, their preferences then go on to elect D.O. Wang of the Palmer United Party and Louise Pratt of the ALP. Um, that 14 vote thing caused a lot of people a bit, bit of concern, so they did it again. This time, the two positions switched. The Shooters and Fishers preferences go to Wayne Dropulich. Wayne Dropulich gets elected eventually, and his preferences go on to elect Scott Ludlam of the Greens. But of course, they lost some votes, didn't they? Um, people smarter than me uh, went through and worked out what those votes would have done, where, where those votes went, and that resulted in this. <laughs> yes, that's one vote. <laughs> so, if they had those votes, then the, the outcome wouldn't have changed. Now, to go back to the ballot that I had up before, the reason why I find this really frustrating is that's how big it is. That's the New South Wales ballot. <laughs> 110 candidates. Um, and that just causes untold confusion. You can either vote above, which takes you five seconds, or you can vote below, which takes you... <laughs> and that results in things like, again, coming back to this, that's how many first preference votes Mr. Dropulich received. Um, after preferences, oh, and that's out of uh, 1.3 million votes. That's how many of you got after preferences. Um, Ricky Muir, who was the other standout um, result. Um, 17,000 votes out of 3.4 million. 
Um, and this just leads me to this. It's way too easy to vote above the line. To give, again, the people who are not overly familiar with this an idea, when you vote above the line, you're accepting a preference ballot filled out by the party whose box you put a number in. Um, I'm not going to go into the fact that there is sometimes more than one. Um, and so you're accepting their preferences without possibly knowing what they are. Uh, because filling out all those boxes below the line is just a pain in the... Um, couple that with people are gaming it. Um, if you look at what happened in the recent election, you had, well, the most obvious one is, is the, the Liberal Democratic Party in New South Wales who had their name changed to make it look like the Liberals and then people voted for them and now they have a senator. Um, but it's more subtle than that too. If you have lots and lots of little parties, all those little parties can point their preferences at each other and it keeps them out of the hands of the major parties until the major party remaining vote share is small enough that they can leapfrog them, get their preferences and get elected. And again, if you want me to go through that again more slowly. Um, but all of these problems just lead me to think that the system is getting a bit undemocratic. Um, not necessarily because the system itself is broken, but just people are taking advantage of it. Um, so how do I fix it? Well, I, my original inspiration for what I ended up doing came from um, this man here. Uh, if you don't recognise him like that, you might recognise him like that. <laughs> That's um, Stephen Fielding of the Family First Party. Um, he got elected in 2007 when the Australian Labor Party, for anyone who doesn't know, they are notionally left-wing-ish, um, and the Australian Democrats, notionally centre-left but no longer relevant, um, both preferenced the Family First Party, uh, right-wing conservative Christians, ahead of the Greens, notionally left-wing, well, actually left-wing, um, and so thus um, meant that the Greens, who polled about 0.9 of a Senate quota, um, lost out to this person, who I think got 2.3% of the vote on first preferences. Now, it occurred to me that there would have been a lot of voters for both of those parties, the Labour and the Democrats, who, for whom a Green would have been preferable to a member of fam from Family First but they weren't given the choice or didn't realise they had the choice or felt like exercising that choice was too hard. Um, and so the first problem I had was, how can I make people more aware of what the Senate preferences are? Um, the Australian Electoral Commission doesn't hide them. Uh, they are available. You could go to an AEC office, because everyone knows where they are. Um, and ask to see the group voting ticket booklet in the couple of weeks prior to polling day. Or you can go up to the desk at your polling place on election day and ask to see the group voting ticket booklet. And in both cases, what you would have seen is something that looked like that. Um, looks a bit familiar. And it's just as easy to read. You can see here that they've got their, their preferences first. Um, obviously, I haven't got the full ballot here, so you can't see where three and four are, but... Um, Actually, this is a really bad one to choose because the Socialist Equality Party did this weird thing where they just numbered straight down the rest of the ballot. But you, you, can, you can read through that and you can sort of see that you'd have to follow where the preferences go in those boxes at the bottom to actually have any idea who you're voting for. Um, uh, they started putting... They put them up as PDFs um, at the 2010 election and the most recent one, they had them as CSVs. Um, so, yes, the first... Step was obviously make it readable. Put their first preference at the top all the way down. And that would hopefully give people the, idea, the ability to see, right, okay, you've got, you know, the Labour Party is preferencing themselves, obviously, because they have to, and then these people and these people and so on. But what if the user didn't like it? Make it so they can change it. Um, if people can actually express their preference, then that's kind of where I want to go with this. Um, but then, of course, you had the issue of, okay, so they've done that, now what do we do? 
Um, and so I figured, well, we have this you know, wonderful layout format that they've got with the, the boxes everywhere. So let's put it back in that so that when they walk into the, the polling place, they can just sit down, well, not sit down, take their ballot and just copy the numbers into the right places on the ballot and they're done. Um, and I should point out at this point that I do geeky stuff, but most of my geeky stuff is very much of the back end variety. I'm not a front end developer. So, you know, this was a bit of a challenge for me. Um, and um, <laughs> um, and it's also coupled by the fact that I'm a perfectionist. Um, I find it really hard to sort of get out of that mind, the, the bit of your brain where you're going, this is how it should look, and get into actually making it. And so I I'd use this as an exercise to try and focus on two principles that I'd heard about, one of which is that, which stands for that. So the, the guiding principle behind you ain't going to need it is stop trying to architect five steps ahead of yourself because you may get four of those and then discover you made the wrong choice. Get something working now and then fix it later if it's the wrong thing. The second one was that, which um, as this is a family conference, um, <laughs> JFDI was all about just making myself get out there and do it. Um, again, it's just, I sit there and agonize about whether it's the right, whether I'm doing things the right way and just, no, just do it. Um, and the other two things that I was doing was, as far as architecture went, static content is good content when you're, when you're serving out web stuff to a potentially unbounded number of people. Um, and the other one was, I don't want, to have people accusing me of storing their data and selling it. And on the flip side, I didn't want the, the moral dilemma of what happened if someone came and tried to buy it. Um, so in the end, I, res I resolved to just not store it at all, which is actually easy. You just don't log anything. Um, so the first version of this site, I ran for the 2010 election. Um, there were a few major parts to it. There was a generator. Uh, it was uh, Python script, uh, used Genshi to uh, generate a bunch of static HTML pages. Um, it also generated JSON blobs that the editor used. Um, speaking of which, um, the editor was, strangely enough, written in JavaScript, um, used jQuery. There's a plugin you can get for jQuery called Sortable. Um, it allows you to drag and drop edit things like tables and lists and stuff like that. And the last part was the ballot renderer. Um, it was written in Python. It uses Report Lab to generate uh, PDF. And it was just a little WSGI app. And it was vile. <laughs> Not because anything involved in it was particularly bad. It was just I was running up against the, the time when I needed it to work. And yeah, the, the JFDI principle really came to the fore there. Um, all of this was hosted on DreamHost. Um, I had an account there, they had private servers, I went with that. That worked reasonably well uh, ex until polling day when it melted. Um, not, I don't know whether it was a performance profile with the DreamHost server or the Apache instance it was running behind, but it just it failed to cope. Um, the data for uh, the ballots, I typed in by hand. Um, there were downloadable, parsable versions available uh, through a media feed, but I didn't know about them at the time, and I was just like, I need to get something up. So I came up with a text format that allowed me to enter it reasonably quickly, and I just sat down for an, an afternoon and went for it, and yeah, it was, it was very dull. Um, so that got me to the 2010 version of the site, which um, I have around here somewhere. If I can work out where my mouse pointer's gone, there it is. Uh, it was this one. So this is what people saw on the 2010 vo version of the site. Um, as you can see, my, my styling skills and my HTML are, are truly up front on this. Um, the only complaint I had about the site was this phrase here. Um, I had a comment somewhere in the frequently asked questions list about if you see, this site is meant to be politically neutral, if you see anything that isn't, please tell me. And I had about 
four emails saying, well, that's a bit left wing, isn't it? <laughs> to which I responded, yes, can you tell me any instance where a notionally left wing party used their preferences to elect a notionally right wing candidate? <laughs> um, so just a quick run through of how it worked. Um, you picked which state you were in. Um, it would show you the party list. Uh, you could pick a party. Any preferences? Um, <laughs> all right, you guys are smutty, you are. Um, sorry? The climate change party's preferences are really weird. Yes. Um, if we want to talk about the actual preferences that parties had, that might be a better one for after. Um, so what you can see here is you have just a straight out list showing the, the, um, the, the party name, the candidate name. I had their position within their group there. Um, I don't think that was obvious to a lot of people. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of candidates there. Um, so if we wanted to customize that, we could just click this. We get this view. If we decide we would rather have, um, oh, here we go. Let's decide the greens deserve our, our next preferences. You just move them up there. If we hit create ticket, then it's sorted it back into the ballot order, so group A, B, C, but you'll notice that the numbers will be different. So here you can see Richard Di Natale of the greens has two, Janet Rice is at three. And then if we were ready to take that to the um, thing, just reformats it out and there are a number of conscious design decisions in this. One is that I wanted it to fit on an A4 sheet, um, which is why the font's a little bit squishy. Um, there's a, what, you, what you can't read up the very top here is it says, this is a custom generated voting reference, not under any circumstances to be distributed or used as how to vote material. I didn't want people handing these out as how to votes because I didn't want to get in trouble with the AEC if someone was handing it out at the wrong place. And lastly, I wanted to make sure that people realised that this was not a ballot they could put in the ballot box. <laughs> um, they had to copy it onto the real one, because otherwise their vote would not count. Um, so, yes. Um, and just to show people exactly how horrible the PDF generator code was, I'm just th these bits here, these huge long calculations, I'm particularly proud of. Um, anyway. It's pretty standard for generation, I've seen. Okay, maybe I don't need to feel as quite so bad then. Um, okay, so getting back to there. All right, so, and that worked really well. I had, a, I had media interest. I had lots of people saying thank you. You might have seen the donate button. I made three figures. I th the first one was a one. Um, <laughs> but that covered the cost of running the, the, the private server. So that was awesome. Um, <laughs> Yes. I'm applying to Y Combinator next week. Um, I'm disrupting the nice. Um, so, yes, uh, and that all went really well, uh, except for the melting down on election day. Um, so then we come to the great time between. Um, uh, Julia Gillard uh, announced the election date well in advance, which was great. I knew that I had you know, plenty of time. I had months to get everything ready. So of course I set about modernizing everything and get everything ready well and ahead of time. Um, <laughs> uh, no. So as I mentioned before, um, this time the AEC actually let me know because I asked them on Twitter. The AEC are on Twitter. Um, that they would be releasing the ballots in this magical modern format. Um, don't laugh, it's so much nicer. Um, Python has a CSV module, it just pulls it apart and then you do things with it. Um, I also had help. Um, Michael Pearson is a, is a friend of mine, I've worked with him at several organisations, he's just really good. He also knows a bit more about the front end stuff than I do, at least he knows enough to be able to make Bootstrap do things. Um, uh, we also added a bunch of features for this version of the site. Uh, we had lower house ballots, uh, so you could work out your entire vote in advance because this locks into something that I realised when I was working on the second version of the site is the first one was all about trying to help people vote below the line in the Senate. Um, once I got to this, what I realised with what I wanted out of the site was you know, that was good, but what I really wanted was people to actually engage with the political process. 
Um, there's a lot of voter disengagement in Australia. A lot of people sort of walk up and vote for the way they voted the last several elections, which may be the way their parents voted for the last several elections and so on and so forth. And that felt sad in a way. All these people were just sort of robotically voting for who they thought was the right thing, not actually considering what they were voting for. And so I really wanted, to, uh, I really wanted this idea that people could think about it before they went and see whether the parties they were voting for were the ones that actually represented what they wanted Australia to be in the future. So we also had links to all of the parties and in some cases individual candidates on the site um, so that people could actually go off and say, so who are the Australian Motoring Enthusiasts Party? Um, what do they stand for? What is the, 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 the Stop CSG Party? Um, and all this kind of thing. We also had order by group for the Senate editor so instead of having to order all the candidates, as you saw that I had to do in that last version, you can actually have a view where they were just collapsed into their party groups and you could just order those. So if you didn't care about particular candidates, you could just order the parties. Um, I also, because we were doing lower house, we needed to know what electorate you were in. So we added the ability to use geolocation in the browser, um, address lookups through the Google Maps API uh, to work out what electorate you were in if you weren't sure. Um, we also added the ability to store and share ballots. So if you wanted to show people where, how you were voting um, or you wanted to store it for later, then you could do that. And also built on top of that, we had it to rendering to HTML. So you could have your ballot on your phone, on your tablet, and you could take that with you instead of having to print out a PDF and take a piece of dead tree to add to the, all the rest of the dead tree that's involved in an Australian election. Um, structure of the site this time around. Generator again. Uh, this time it was in Ruby because Hamel. Uh, if you haven't come across Hamel, it's, uh, it's a much more compact format for writing out markup that you then translate into H HTML. Um, you don't have to do all the, the tag stuff, it just works off indentation. Um, and it was actually a, just a big rake script in the end so that we could just compile bits of the site. Um, the front end this time was again JavaScript. We used Angular. Um, mainly because that's how I got Michael involved. Michael's not normally a political guy, but when I said, you can do it in Angular, <laughs> um, that got him interested. And Angular has this, this uh, plugin called UI.sortable. It's the same thing, but wrapped up for Angular. Um, the ballot renderer was, seeing if this is familiar to anyone, um, it was again Python report lab and that, that type of thing. Um, the geolocation support. Um, uh, I don't know whether to credit Pia War for this or someone else, but the AEC actually has the entire division boundaries map as an Esri shape file under a Creative Commons license. Um, and so I loaded that into PostGIS and then whacked a Python thing in front of it to translate lat long to uh, an electoral division. Uh, to, if we were doing address lookups, then we used the Google Maps API to translate to a lat long and then handed that in. Um, or if you were just using browser geolocation, it would just use the browser's location. Storing and sharing, uh, that was just Python sitting in front of Redis. Um, I, just, I used Redis because it was there. Um, the ballot renderer for the HTML side was Ruby, because Hamel. Um, and we made it reactive using some of the bootstrap stuff so it would actually reformat the ballot to fit whatever screen it was on. Um, unfortunately, we were, we were never able to get the time to try and make, get the editor working on mobile because drag and drop on touch screens is twisty. Um, so I mentioned that we were storing ballots in this version. Um, I did think a lot about this because I didn't want to have it stored. In the end, I decided it was okay if it was completely anonymous. So every ballot was stored under a random identifier that was never reused. If you came back and stored, if you loaded up your ballot and then stored it again, it would give you a new random ID. And I had no logging that tied anything to those random IDs. If you then shared that URL on Twitter, that was up to you. If you didn't want anyone to know, you just left it alone and people could 
probably walk through and get a whole bunch of ballots out there, but there would be nothing that tied them to you. Um, this time for hosting, I went with Rackspace. Uh, the main reason I went with Rackspace was because they started offering free accounts to open source projects, and I had intended to open source it anyway. So I got in touch with uh, Jesse Noller, uh, who is their, one of their open source guys, and said it's not exactly the standard kind of thing, but do you mind? And he's fine. Uh, so that all went really well. Um, and I had Cloudflare in front as a CDN. Again, most of the site was static. So I, it just, the, I don't think the backing servers on Rackspace got above a load average of, of one. I don't think they even made one. It was beautiful to watch. Um, so the 2013 version of the site is As you can see, it looks a little bit nicer. Um, we used Bootstrap for the styling uh, with a theme that came from somewhere. I can't remember exactly. Um, the geolocation just works for browser. So we realized partway through that we really needed to make sure that people um, were, that's not working very well, is it? We needed to confirm that people were where they thought they were because sometimes the geolocation will give you a the address of your ISP's rack as your location. So maybe we'll just try doing um, And if this doesn't work, we have a fallback for that too. Uh, okay. Oh, this this may not go well then because this is uh, this is actually the live site, but we'll see. Okay, we'll we'll be in Perth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hang on, just a sec. Allow me to. That one. This one here. Technical difficulties. Um, let's just, yeah, I was just going to do that. Goodbye, Wi Fi. Hey, success. Okay, so this is the electorate of Perth, currently represented, well, at the time by Stephen Smith. Is he, st I can't remember, did he resign? I can't remember. He um, resigned. Yeah. Here are the, the lower house candidates, and there's the current senators. Um, Next time, I won't have the current senators next to the lower house candidates. That confused a few people. Um, we can view preferences. One of the other features we added was the, uh, the ability to compare two sets of preferences. So if you want to say, I'm interested in the WikiLeaks party and I want to compare them to the Greens, you can see where they put people. Um, you can work your way through those if you want. You can share the, the ballots. Um, I had a, a short URL registered and it would encode the ballot pair that you're looking at and you could send it out and say, hey guys, look at these preference tickets. Uh, if you wanted to then actually edit, ballot editor for Perth. So you had your lower house ballot on this side, your upper house ballot on the other side. Um, I'm a hippie commie, so I'm going to have the greens first. Um, and then that, and independents are always interesting. And that can stay the rest as it is. Here's the order by group. So again, you can just drag, you can drag these groups around. Or you could start with an existing preference ticket. So I might go with stop the greens just to be perverse. Um, that of course forces you into the candidate view just because of the way the, the uh, lower house ballots work. And so when we're ready to, that, to do that, we can save it if we like. 
That gives us a short URL. That's the random identifier I was talking about before. And we can then open that up. And that's the HTML form of the ballot. And if I take that off and play with the size of the window, you can see that it reacts. And then if we go back here, we can also get the PDF version. We added a couple of nice bits to the PDF. There's your lower house ballot in green, so you can tell it's, it's the lower house bit. Um, there's also the, the watermark behind everything, just to make sure that people knew where it came from. Apart from that, it's largely the same. And of course, with the number of candidates in the lower house ballot, there was no way I was fitting it on one sheet. Um, all right. So, so yeah. And the site worked fairly well this time. We had nearly 2,600 people, well, over 2,600 concurrent users on election day. Um, I, was, I had uh, one of the monitoring sites watching the, the thing, and I was just watching the number go up and up and up. It was quite fun. Um, we had over 165,000 unique visitors. That's, you know, that's a result. I would happily have more, but then I didn't really have time to publicize the site a whole lot. Uh, most of it was via word of mouth on things like Twitter and Facebook. But I still get people who come up to me and say, oh, my, you know, I used your site. My, my, my friends used your site. My family used your site. And that's always great. Um, we generated nearly 34,000 PDFs. Um, so what's next? Um, well, I really want to get the editor working better. Uh, the site can always use work. It's all up on GitHub um, if anyone wants to have a look at how it's all done. Um, and so, yeah, in conclusion, it's broken. I would love to see it fixed. I don't know whether that will happen, what needs to do to make it happen, but the fact that I, you can go out, register a whole bunch of little parties, have them preference each other, and then try and win a seat that way is kind of broken. Um, you too can change the world. I'm not a, usually a website kind of guy, but I got annoyed enough to do this. You know, it's, it's the same sort of thing as starting up an open source project in a lot of ways. If you've got an itch, you go and scratch it. I just had an itch that was more political than it was technological. Um, and if you do get that kind of thing, just do it. Uh, if you want to read a couple, uh, couple of things more about the way the, uh, the counting worked in that, that election, then um, those are two blog posts by Anthony Green. Uh, that are well worth reading. And with that, I thank you. Did you get any sort of pushback from the AEC or the political parties or the media saying, who the hell are you? Are um, the question was, did I get any pushback from the Australian Electoral Commission or any of the parties or the media? Um, the first version of the site, the, this was, that was before the AEC had switched to the Creative Commons license they're using now. And I had a copyright disclaimer at the bottom saying that the, you know, the, the ballot data was copyright the AEC. And they got in touch with me saying, uh, you haven't asked for permission to use that. Um, at which point I promptly asked and it was promptly given. <laughs> That's, I haven't received any communication from parties directly, although I did, uh, except for, I did chat to some people from the Greens who gave me their list of candidates for this election. Um, and uh, I also had a brief exchange with Family First about the same, getting the same sort of thing. In the end, the AEC got the candidate <coughs> lists up and I just took them from there. I think early iterations of the 2013 site were using a candidate list I pulled from the ABC. Uh, and that had a few inaccuracies, but they all got fixed when the, the AEC data came through. It comes, comes through two weeks before? Yes. Generally, the, there's a six-week campaign period. Nominations open at the start. Nominations close about yeah, three or four weeks in, and then the nominations are declared along with and then, and then the parties have a 24-hour period to lodge the group voting tickets. Uh, yes? Is there any intention to have uh, candidate positions on certain things so as you view your list, you can also on the side just have 
simple yes no on things and then sort by what your preferences mm. are? The question was uh, whether we wanted to have candidate uh, positions on various issues. That had occurred to me. The problem is actually working out what your list of issues is and actually th there's a bit of editorialising involved in that that I felt a bit uncomfortable with. I would happily have links to other sites that contain information and background on the candidates, but uh, not only am I not an HTML front-end developer, I'm not a journalist. Um, and I just don't feel comfortable generating that kind of information myself. Uh, one from over here. Um, first, I'd like to say I actually used your site for both elections and did both the line. line. Uh, great success. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank um, you. And I was actually more curious if anyone else here had actually used it to successfully the line and help them do that. So. <laughs> uh, for, for the, the question was how many other people used it, and for the benefit of people who can't see the audience, there were many hands raised. Um. Um, and also the, the uh, order by group thing was, mm -hmm. was great. That helped. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. Um, would you make the, um, obviously not with any identifying information, the, um, the choice of people made public? The reason I'm asking is the AAC actually published what all the below the line votes mm. were, and you could, you could figure out what your success rate was, because most of the below the line votes, they were cast for you. Yeah. So you could actually go and find them. I could do that. Uh, <laughs> That makes me yeah. a little bit nervous, I think. But yes, I could do that. I mean, even, even if you didn't make the yeah. people... Well, I don't, I don't have any linkage to who they are. Yeah, um, you, could, um, you could just go find out how successful you were. Just yeah. Curiosity anyway. uh, yes, uh, up the back there. Um, you don't log anything, but it's all over HTTP, so if somebody were to say you have a massive nationwide surveillance network... <laughs> <laughs> yes, they could. That is true. Um, I personally... Um, well, actually, the first version was over HTTPS. Um, that actually caused a bunch of issues uh, for various people, mainly because I think I had some widgets on there that were loading over HTTP, and so people were getting scary security warnings. This time I didn't do it because I'm lazy. Um, but you're right, I should have it over HTTPS for the next time. Uh, just one more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But, moving on to my question, um, are there any plans on extending this for state elections? I did run the 2010 version in a number of state elections. Uh, the issue there is that each state does it slightly differently. Um, Queensland, of course, doesn't have one. Um, New South Wales has one giant region covering the entire state. Victoria has five regions across the state. Um, and yeah, the, the problem was with New South Wales was you had to field a huge number of candidates in each group and then I had to try and work out how to format that. So it would take a bit of thought. However, there is an open source project now. It's on GitHub. Pull requests accepted. <laughs> uh, yes? Separately from the possibility of your site being surveilled, mm -hmm. I would suggest it's going to be attacked and probably subtly. Are you going to do anything about that? Um, Oh, I see what you're getting at, yes. Um, that is a deeply worrying prospect. Uh, sorry, the, for the record, the question was, um, well, the, the, the comment was that someone could pick up on a unique identifier, change the data in that identifier, and then do it. Actually, I never reuse the identifiers. The only time you ever get one back is when you post a new thing saying store this, and then you get a new identifier back. The only way you're ever supposed to back, Yeah. Yeah. What's up there and changing the bulk of it so that they don't care which actual person votes for them as long as they've changed the vote for the majority. Mm. And a reasonable simple solution for that mm. to make the identifier some way a hash of the actual contents, that way the identifier we'll, we'll show you know, it must be mm. the same, but yeah. at least you can audit it. The yep. website may return different. Yep. Fair enough. Um, yes, up the back there. There was another website doing similar things. Yes. I can't uh, so it was either senate.io or cluevoter.com. Um, yes, I have. I, I looked at both Senate.io and Cluey Voter. Um, Senate.io 
had a much better editor than me. I will freely pay that one. Um, the, my problem with Senate.io was that the, uh, the creator of that site felt that they shouldn't link to party information or provide any information on the parties themselves for fear of influencing the voter. Um, my problem was that I wanted to influence the voter but not to a particular party, just to think. And I couldn't do that without providing information. Uh, Cluey Voter is the one that's run by Alan Noble, I think. Uh, and that approach was more to ask people their opinions on a bunch of, uh, of issue areas and then match that to parties and suggest that you should vote in a particular way. Uh, my problem with that was, again, it was editorialising on, like, I don't know what the Animal Justice League policy on immigration is. And I don't want, I, I don't have the time to find out. And even if I did, it could be more nuanced than for or against. So, yeah. Uh, yes. Do you have any thoughts on how we, uh, how we make the ballot, the, the voting process below the line a bit easier? Um, I would keep below the line voting as it is. What I would, my preferred option, and this is just me throwing ideas out, is, um, hang on, let's see if I can get it back to... Above the line? Yeah, well, yeah, above the line preferencing. Hang on, let's find my, my lovely uh, slide here. There it is. Um, so what I would prefer to see is if each of these groups below the line had to have the six candidates that were necessary to be elected, you could have optional above the line preferencing. So a single one would still be a valid vote because you are nominating enough candidates uh, to fill all the vacancies. But if you then, uh, but your vote would then exhaust after that group. Um, if you if you put, if you filled in multiple boxes above the line, then you would be expressing those groups in order on the ballot. So if I'd voted one, two, three, there, I'd have these candidates, then these candidates, then these candidates. Yes. <laughs> Usually the confusion works for the benefit, now it doesn't. Yep. So the discussions range from optimal preparation below the line, introducing optimal preparation above the line, removing the automatic preferencing and just having it optimal preferential. Mm. Um, Anthony Green uh, also has a, a piece on options for reforming the Senate, I believe. And he's probably the cleverest person in Australia when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yes. That is something that I thought about doing, uh, possibly not as below the line, but possibly as some other site. Um, I know that there's sites like, um, oh God, I've forgotten their name. The people, uh, the people that open Australia. Um, yeah, they, what they do is they index Hansard, which uh, is the, the record of everything that is said in, the cha in both chambers of parliament. And you can sign up for alerts and say, you, you want to see what your senators are saying. You can, re you can choose to receive alerts every time one of them has a speech in parliament, what they say, and that kind of stuff. Um, I, d I think there's value in that kind of a site. I'm just not sure how to put it together. Um, yes? When you were starting out, so before the president's general election, mm -hmm. how did you actually get out there? Because um, when the vote line kind of gets the line stuff around, mm -hmm. people, and I, I'm struggling because I just can't, I can't imagine getting the vote line stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you got quite a bit of traction, but then you had to go and get that So the question was, how did I uh, get the site out there? Um, I'm trying to remember. I basically started telling my friends about it and it snowballed. Um, then it came, started coming to the attention of the media and one of the biggest uh, traffic sources I had during the 2010 campaign was that I got interviewed by a journalist from News Limited and it got put up on news.com.au and it was actually on the front page for a while and that was a significant amount of traffic. Uh, the, I also did a bunch of radio interviews. Uh, this time I don't think I ended up in any newspapers, but I definitely got some radio. I did, there was a, 
a piece on Radio National that was quite good. And that, and that was where I got the idea for the experiment at the start about whether people knew what the second and third preferences were if they voted above the line. Uh, I actually suggested to the journalist that he go and, and ask that question of people. And he actually did a, a brief Vox Pop segment in the piece where he asked them and the result was largely the same. Yes? One thing I'd like to see you did in JFDI <laughs> was uh, a visualisation. Uh, so you've got this cluster of parties that are exchanging mm. preferences with each other and you can see there's one in there that you really don't fancy at all, mm. there's others over there that yeah. are miles away from the people you intend to give your first preference to be quite mm. like the mm. relation. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yes. The slides. Where can we get them? Um, I'll put them up. I'll put them online in a bit. Thanks. From, from um, the, I'll see if I can get the, them to put them up on the the mirror. The, the conference is collecting them all. Okay. So they should go up, but I'm not sure when. All right. I will get them to the conference, and uh, they will put them up. All righty. I think that means we're done. Your slides. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'll put the one there. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much.